This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've lived and worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas for almost 30 years, and I started self-work five years ago in order to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might already be very interested in psychological, emotional issues. Maybe you're in therapy as well, but would enjoy another perspective. To the group of you who might just have been diagnosed with something and you're looking for answers or you're having a relationship issue that you just can't seem to settle or find a way through, but also to a third group of you. To those of you who might sit around and tell your friends, ah, oh, that therapy stuff, that's for the birds, I'd never do it, but you're curious enough or sadly unhappy enough to want to listen to self-work. So welcome to all of you. This is our second, second time around self-work episode as the team takes the holidays off and I work on book number two. I love this series on the most recent research on depression and what it indicates are the diverse potential sources or reasons for someone to experience depression. These episodes were first recorded in 2019, so the information was the newest I could find then. Certainly what I can say is that the research I've seen since has been further evidence that depression is not simply a chemical imbalance. And you might want to check out the links in the show notes that will lead you to even more recent research. Today, I'm again using a very well-written by a team at Harvard as a guide, and we'll look at the non-neurological things that have a tremendous influence on whether or not you could become depressed, specifically stress, trauma, medical illnesses, and medications themselves. And, as typical, I throw in some of my own observations and thoughts. And as always, there's a focus on treatment or what you can do about it. Today's listener's question is a poignant one. She and her husband have been booted out of her daughter's life, and the daughter seems to have a history of significant emotional problems and is in therapy. So, the question is how this mother could approach this very painful estrangement from her daughter, as she wonders if the therapy itself is encouraging the daughter's behavior. But before we begin, let's hear from a wonderful sponsor we gained in 2021, Athletic Greens or AG1. Our partner, AG1, has a product I use every day. I started taking Athletic Greens, frankly, because they were interested in sponsoring self-work, and I never recommend something to you without trying it first. With one scoop of AG1, whose taste is somewhere between sweet and tart to me, you'll get 75 high-quality minerals, vitamins, probiotics, adaptogens, and whole food source superfoods, which support everything from your gut to your immune system to your energy level. I love it because whether I'm home and about to go out for a walk or traveling and about to spend time with friends and family, I can start my day proactively, knowing I'm doing something for my own self-care. If you're like me, self-care can get lost for sure. In fact, its founder, after having severe gut issues, realized he was taking over $100 a day worth of supplements, which had their own very complicated dosage routine, so he created Athletic Greens. To make it easy, and because you're a self-work listener, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is to visit athleticgreens.com slash selfwork. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash selfwork to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And now sit back. Relax and enjoy Self-Work 143. Is depression simply a chemical imbalance? The answer is no. I'm going to start this episode with the same quote I started part one with because I think it basically summarizes what the whole Harvard article was all about. And I quote, It's often said that depression results from a chemical imbalance, but that figure of speech doesn't capture how complex the disease is. 
research suggests that depression doesn't spring from simply having too much or too little of certain brain chemicals. Rather, there are many possible causes of depression, including faulty mood regulation by the brain, genetic vulnerability, stressful life events, medications, trauma, and medical problems. It's believed that several of these forces interact to bring on depression. So first, let's talk about stressful life events. We all talk about how stressed we are, right? Nearly everyone encounters stress. The death of a loved one, the loss of a job, an illness, a relationship spiraling downward. Remember, even positive things can cause stress. A new job, a new baby, a move to a city that you're excited about, but it's also stressful. Some must cope with the early loss of a parent or have violence or sexual abuse. While not everyone who faces these stresses develops a mood disorder, in fact, most do not, stress plays an important role in depression. As I explained in part one, or actually Harvard explained to us, your genetic makeup influences how sensitive you are to stressful life events. That's why some of us can have a stressful situation happen and we don't get depressed, and yet others do. When genetics, biology, and stressful life situations come together, depression can result. We all know the fight-or-flight response, right? That's when a part of your brain releases chemicals that trigger certain bodily responses. Your heart beats faster. The blood travels from your mid-region to your feet and hands, so literally, you have the strength to run away or to fight. But even if the stressor is imagined or irrational, your body can still create the stress response. It responds to the part of your brain that says, danger, danger, whether or not you're there's simply a big spider by you, which you can walk away from, or there's an 18-wheeler coming your way. Without going into too much of the actual regions of the brain where this stress response is released, there are several steps to this process, and it ends with the production of what's called cortisol. The boost in cortisol readies your body to fight or flee. As we said before, your heart beats faster, actually up to five times more quickly than normal. Your blood pressure rises. Your breath quickens as your body takes in extra oxygen. Sharpened senses such as sight and hearing make you more alert. And that effect of cortisol can be extremely powerful. Here's a story from my own life. If you've listened, you know I'm quite the storyteller, or I think I am. (laughs) I was working late one night. This was years ago. Haven't gotten off work at the hotel where I was singing around one in the morning. I was winding down when I heard this crash outside of my apartment. I ran out the front door and could see that there was a car overturned and someone was in it. There were tiny flames beginning to be created. I'm not truly sure what possessed me, but I ran toward the car, all of about 115 pounds of me at the time, and pulled the driver out. There's no way that I had that kind of physical strength. That was the effect of adrenaline and cortisol. I'm sure many of you have had similar experiences. <laughs> now, I have to share with you the funny thing about this particular memory is that the driver was quite inebriated and kept saying how sorry he was that he'd hit a car. I was very empathic until I saw the car he'd hit was mine. No more cortisol, for sure. Normally, the body turns off the fight-or-flight defense when the threat passes. But in some cases, actually, the gates never close properly, and cortisol levels rise too often or simply stay high. This can contribute to problems such as high blood pressure, suppression of your immune system, asthma, and depression. Studies have shown that people who are depressed typically have increased levels of cortisol, meaning you keep more cortisol in your system than a healthier, less depressed person does. So you can only imagine what happens if you stay stressed out. It's like you're traveling at 90 miles per hour for hours on end. You're going to feel spent and stimulated all at the same time. So hopefully that helps you see the effect of stress on depression. Now let's focus a little bit on trauma. Trauma is something that happens to you that is out of the ordinary and that is very destructive to your sense of well-being and safety. Any kind of abuse or an accident 
or a tornado or anything like that is traumatic. And then you can have more chronic traumas that are more ongoing situations that lead you to not feel secure or safe. Things like bullying, stressors like having a severe learning disability that no one recognizes, those kinds of things. So this may be somewhat of a no-brainer, but researchers have found that early losses and emotional trauma may leave individuals more vulnerable to depression later in life. But what is troubling is that you can be unaware of what's causing the depression. You know you're down. You know that certain things or situations make you feel worse, trapped, or unhappy for no reason. But you can't really identify the relationship. In fact, a great deal of the way I work with patients is to help them begin to see how they're getting triggered, why they're unhappy, why they feel trapped, why they feel worse. It's not full-out post-traumatic stress disorder where you can have flashbacks or nightmares, but there's something in the present that's maybe even unconsciously connected with something from the past. Many of you who've listened to these podcasts for a while know that I'm writing a book, well, it's actually written, it comes out November the 1st, on what I term perfectly hidden depression. And certainly a major part of that book is giving a technique called a trauma timeline which can help begin to identify how trauma could be affecting you in the present. And if you want to listen to that episode, it's episode 109. So what is going on physically or even neurologically with trauma? There's an interesting study that found that women who had been abused physically or sexually as children actually had more extreme stress responses than women who had not been abused. And this wasn't because... They were being abused in the experiment. They were actually being asked to do something that had nothing to do with their original trauma. They were working out mathematical equations or speaking in front of an audience. But the women that had been abused as children had greater levels of cortisol. This is an amazing sign that early trauma can directly affect the way you handle stress now or whether or not you get depressed. Basically, the idea seems to be that they're working on. If your life is defined early on by trauma, you're more likely to have a greater reaction to stress. What's important here to realize is this is not genetic predisposition, as we talked about in the last episode. This is due to trauma. Now, we're briefly going to go over medical problems that seem to be connected with mood disturbances like depression. In fact, the Harvard article quotes, medical illnesses or medications may be at the root of up to 10 to 15% of all depressions. Among the best known culprits are two thyroid hormone imbalances. The first is an excess of thyroid hormone called hyperthyroidism, and it can actually trigger manic symptoms being really elated and overly euphoric and impulsive, and you have racing thoughts. On the other hand, hypothyroidism, a condition in which your body produces too little thyroid hormone, can often lead to exhaustion and depression. So whenever I've got someone in front of me that I'm beginning to suspect may have bipolar disorder or some kind of cyclic disorder, I try to always suggest to them that they go get their thyroids checked first. I never want to call something mental that actually has a physical or medical problem underneath it. Another medical problem that is very commonly linked to depression, in fact, I saw this with my dad for sure, is heart attack survivors. Many report feeling blue and having significant depression. I've also noticed in my practice that someone who's had brain surgery has similar kinds of issues. Again, You know, your heart and your brain are very vital parts of your functioning. Research shows that depression can spell trouble for heart patients, for example. It's been linked with slower recovery, future cardiovascular problems, and a higher risk of dying within about six months. We're going to touch briefly on some other medical problems that can have a strong link with depression. Nutritional deficiencies, such as a lack of vitamin B12, so you want to check that out. Other endocrine disorders, like something wrong with your adrenal glands, you can check adrenal functioning. Certain immune system diseases, such as lupus, 
neurological conditions such as MS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, some viruses and other infections, including hepatitis and HIV, of course, cancer, and erectile dysfunction in men. Now, as I looked at this list, I did kind of wonder, just my common sense, wondered if it was the disease itself that might create depression or some of the chronic losses associated with them. I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's an interesting one to ask. The last factor in creating depression are medications themselves. For example, I take propanolol, which is actually a blood pressure medication. I take it if I'm afraid I'm going to have a panic attack because it's very effective. And that's one medication that is shown to cause depression. And truthfully, I've noticed when I take it, I'll notice a slight drop in my mood that's not connected to anything happening. That doesn't prove anything. It's my personal experience. And it's a price I'm willing to pay to not have an anxiety attack. But you need to check with your doctor or pharmacist, especially if somehow when you began taking a medication for some condition, your own joy in living seemed further away or harder to reach. So please be attentive to that as well. So now, of course, I'm going to talk about what you can do about it. By now, you know I'm a huge believer in therapy to help you figure out what the stress is in your life and how to keep it monitored and modulated. Mindfulness, which we covered in episode 91, can be very helpful. You need to identify the trauma there may be in your life that you've discounted. And again, this is big in my work on perfectly hidden depression. You can look into the effect of whatever medical illness you have and how is that affecting your satisfaction with life. And you can really be careful about the medications you take because some of them could be at least exacerbating or even causing depression itself. That's a lot to think about. But what I really wanted to stress in the last episode and in this one is that when you hear someone say, or you yourself thought, ah, oh, depression's a chemical imbalance, all I have to do is take a medication, I'll be okay. It's simply more complex than that. And I hope that these episodes have shown you that very fact. We still have so much to learn. So stay curious and be your own advocate if you have depression and want to try to work with it and heal. So today, again, as I said in the introduction, we have a little different format for our listener email. So here's the listener's question. I'm wondering if you could help us. Our 24-year-old daughter is estranged from our family. We believe that she has borderline personality disorder. And she is pregnant with a second grandchild who is due in November, and we have been trying to make amends with her and restore our family. She is not speaking to anyone from our family, her brother, her cousins, her aunts, and her uncles, and we are struggling trying to restore the relationship, and we really are at a loss. We believe that she is in therapy But it seems like the therapy is just confirming to her that her family is the root cause of all of her problems, and it is not creating a healthy relationship and healing, it's just creating more distance. And we wanted to know if there is anything that you may advise us to perhaps work with her or suggest to us so that we can reach out to her and keep healthy boundaries and perhaps give us some hope. Thank you. And here's my answer. First of all, I want to thank you for leaving such an eloquent and well put together question. Several things came to mind. Estrangement in and of itself holds stigma for some people. To say you're estranged from your parents or your adult children often brings with it comments like, oh, have you tried this, that, or the other? Don't let pride get in the way. Everybody needs family. But estrangement is sometimes justified and sometimes not. If you're one doing the estranging and you have a really good reason, then those comments are more than hurtful. 
Many abused adult children have no relationship with their parent for really good reasons. But if someone has estranged themselves from you, and as this woman does, suspects mental illness or a personality disorder, and you don't understand the reason for the estrangement, you're totally blamed for what went on, then that is also extremely painful. If you bring children and grandchildren into the picture, the hurt can feel devastating. I've always believed that withdrawal is a very potent form of control, and estrangement is all about withdrawal. This mother believes her daughter to also experience borderline symptoms, meaning her mood swings are highly intense. She perceives abandonment where there is none. There can be frequent and dramatic self-destructive tendencies, and there is often a severe sense of emptiness inside her very being. Reconciling with someone with these characteristics can be extremely hard, to say the least. You've just gotten finished, in fact, listening to an episode that's all about the complexities of depression. I can assure you the complexities of borderline personality disorder and really any personality disorder are also just as staggering. As far as your daughter's therapy not helping, I think two things. One, even if the therapy is good and appropriate, patients can still hear what they want to hear or perceive a comment in a way that's simply not accurate. Also, it's important to remember that this therapist is hearing the story in a way that might suggest that parents have been at fault in some way. So you never know the story that the other person is telling. Borderline symptoms are often noticeable. At the same time, since these people feel abandoned very, very easily, often a therapist has to move very slowly before they introduce the idea that some of their perceptions might be distorted. Either way, it's difficult. What I recommend but I also will frankly admit isn't always effective. First, I think you should go into therapy yourself, the woman who wrote me. Then give permission to your own therapist to reach out to their daughter's therapist and see if conjoint sessions could occur. That means both therapists are there. It can be hard to work out schedule-wise, but often, especially with someone with borderline traits, it works better than a mediator because they already trust the therapist they have. At the least, you'll get your own support and feedback, and you know you're doing everything you can. And perhaps you'll get new information. Maybe not welcome info, but new info. The other thing is, as hard as it is, give it time. I do hear some urgency in your voice. What can we do? What can we do? And it may be that you need to modulate your own urgency. I don't have grandchildren, but I can't imagine going without seeing my son on a fairly regular basis. I can only imagine what that feels like. But you may be feeding into her need for control. Instead, you can simply say, again, perhaps through her therapist, that you are always ready to talk and to listen. The other thing is, however, as I listen to myself, and I didn't actually write this down, she may be using your love up, and you may have a lot of grieving to do. So you'll have to balance out in your own minds and hearts what you still want to offer to her and how you may need to protect yourselves and other members of your family. Good luck to you. So thanks as always for being here. I'm very grateful to you that you take the time to listen to self-work and make it a part of your day or week. And I hope this series of Second Time Arounds will be something you really enjoy. Of course, my book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, is available on Amazon or wherever you buy books or at your library. And I would love for you to pick up a copy, especially if you're someone who keeps pretty tight control over their emotions. You just may not be realizing, unless you respond to the term Perfectly Hidden Depression, that you have things that you've been keeping secret or silent for way too long, and it would be very helpful and healing to address some of them. My book will help you do just that. And of course, to any and all of you who've left ratings and reviews, or would think about leaving a rating and review on Amazon for Perfectly Hidden Depression, I would so appreciate it. As well, for self-work anywhere you listen, especially on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. They're by far the larger 
of the listening platforms, but all of them are important. If you'd leave me a written review, too, that would be awesome. Quite a holiday gift for me and for self-work. There are many ways to reach out to me. My website is drmargaretrutherford.com, and you can subscribe there, and you'll get a weekly newsletter with my blog post, my podcast, and any bonus episodes or things I'm going to do or be involved in. My email is askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com, and you can write me a question or a comment. You can also leave me a comment or a voicemail on SpeakPipe, which is found in your show notes, but also on my website. I have a Facebook closed group at facebook.com slash group slash self-work. And last but not least, I have a new interactive podcast using the iPhone Fireside app. It's called Self-Work Chat, and it's where you and I can actually talk. So if you go to firesidechat.com slash Margaret Rutherford, again, firesidechat.com slash Margaret Rutherford and request access to Fireside, hopefully you can join me there sooner rather than later. I'm so grateful again you are here and are here every week. Tell your friends. That would be fantastic. Please take very good care. As always, I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.